Hello, scholars. Uh, we're continuing on with progressivism. This era, roughly 1870s, after the Civil War, in response to, you know, robber barons and, and uh, perceived to be uh, mismanagement of a lot of things in America, a group of people are going to bring order, bring management, bring, make things better in California. And one of the, uh, this is a nationwide movement, of course, and we have all sorts of things going wide nationwide, but California is a very special circumstance. It's a leading progressive state. A lot of really uh, important things are developed here. And most interestingly is a lot of women are like very involved in California. You know, women are involved in progressivism everywhere. There's dynamic progressive with women everywhere. But California has more than its share of progressive women. And I'm gonna run through a whole bunch of just sort of like, give you some background here to this uh, and just get you thinking about these women and get you conscious of them and looking for them. And so, you know, wherever you go, uh, where you live, if you're up there teaching in Lodi, California, uh, you'll see, hey, there's a great story of a woman from Lodi, I'm gonna tell you. I'm so, so the thing is that these women are out there and, uh, and so look for them and, uh, and they're great to teach about, they're great to study, they're great, they're very interesting people. So California in a special sort of like women's uh, progressivism as a type of very feminine state. We are uh, named after a woman, Calafia, who is this sort of Amazonian leader of a, uh, of a uh, what was supposed to be sort of an island nation. It's an, in a novel that this Spanish, a Spanish novel from the uh, 15th century, I think. And it's, uh, it's the Amadis de Gaulle, I think is the title of it. But women, Calafia and, and, uh, and, uh, and progressivism. So let me just run through some fun stuff here. It's a lot of fun information. Okay, first of all, uh, we talked about these clubs. Women tend to be very powerful through clubs in, and they do lots of local stuff. They're in the local neighborhoods. This is Point Loma. Point Loma has its local women's clubs and these Women dominate this thing. Now, in California as a whole, there's these women, you read about Phoebe Hurst and all the, the, you know, the clubs and stuff that she gets involved with in supporting. And uh, there's even a, a uh, federation of clubs and stuff that are run by women. But uh, oftentimes what you have are some very wealthy women who are putting up the money. And in California, the three great wealthy women uh, and there's some others too, but these are these are huge. Uh, this is is Phoebe Hearst, Ellen Scripps, and Jane Stanford. And I had you read about Scripps and, and Hearst, and uh, and uh, there are many things to do. These are wonderful women, um, and uh, there's also a lot of other women who are not of the great wealth, but are actually supported by the clubs, supported by the by the um, uh, their own businesses, by themselves. And uh, uh, many of them graduating from UC Berkeley, uh, which was co-ed from the beginning, Stanford, which was co-ed from the beginning. And you have, and then we're gonna talk about Mills College and stuff, there's, there's these educational centers which are producing a lot of, of dynamic women. This is Kate Sessions. She's our uh, you know, great horticulturalist here in San Diego. Here's our Lodi woman. Uh, this woman here, Laura DeForest Gordon, okay? She's from Lodi, she runs for the state senate. Uh, Cal Western, Western states tended to lead in the uh, development of uh, women's rights politically. Uh, she becomes editor, and then she's at another newspaper, she becomes owner, she does all sorts of fun stuff. She becomes a lawyer, president of the California State Suffrage Association, for these 10 years and paid speaker. So she becomes an employed feminist suffrage speaker traveling around. So, very dynamic woman. Now another woman who is associated heavily with California, comes from New England as a novelist, Helen Hunt Jackson. This woman's amazing and she writes, she's written a lot of novels, but she gets dedicated to Indian, um, uh, Indian affairs and, and the progressive movements desire to figure out how to how to treat the Indians better, you know, how to how to handle this Indian situation. 
So uh, she is a commissioner for federal commissioner for Indian Affairs with this guy Abbott Kenny, who's the forester and developer up in up in Pasadena and out in Pacific Palisades, and they. Uh, travel around uh, up the San Diego River, down the San Luis Rey River, reporting on, on the many, many Indian villages and how the Indians are living and, and about their trials and tribulations. And, and this is a report, and she is an Indian commissioner for that. She goes, uh, she had written this already, that's why she was named an Indian commissioner, but then to, to, for this California situation, she writes one of the most powerful novels of of Indian romance in California. So everybody read this, and there's, we have a town of Ramona, we have the Ramona festivals and things like that. And it's a great story, you should read it. And uh, frankly, it's this time uh, in which you're incarcerated in your houses uh, by this disease is a good time to read. There's lots of great stuff to read. This is a long novel, but it's, it, it just carries you through a lot of, of good Indian, uh, good geography of California. Uh, this is the Santa Clara River where the where the novel starts at this at this uh, rancho and she gets to Temecula and she gets to backcountry San Diego uh, and I throw this in too she's a little late for progressivism but not really uh, she's at that last little bit and this is a, <clears throat> a woman Florence Shippick who's here in San Diego she becomes dedicated to the women's cause uh, the Indians cause and she writes this beautiful book about the local Indians. And so she's an heir to that women's progressivism, but then also to Helen Hunt Jackson. And uh, look at her, very, she's a good woman, you know. And she died recently. She lives here, she lived here in Point Loma. Her husband was a professor at UC San Diego. She had a degree in, um, I think, PhD in anthropology. Uh, Might have been archaeology, but I think it was anthropology. And then you have women like Janine Jan Carr, I think that's how you pronounce it. And up in Pasadena, she's from Wisconsin. She had actually met John Muir in Wisconsin, and Muir sort of treats her as a big sister. And, and they write letters back and forth, Christian uh, issues and all sorts of stuff. But she comes to Pasadena and creates this Carmelita, this sort of uh, beautiful uh, estate dedicated to uh, botany and things like that. And uh, she's working with her husband, Ezra, and they're very involved in the foresting and with Abbott Kinney and all this, uh, this stuff of progressive era um, things. But she's this emphasis, you know, the, the, we love John Muir, one of the most important Californians, but who did John Muir go to? It was Jan Carr. Jan Carr was like his, his uh, Maybe we, we might even say his most important and most long-lived advisor to him in his life. So, very important. Now what I want to uh, do, though, is, is that what the, the main area of women's influence in progressivism across the country, but here especially in California, is education. And um, so let's step back and, and look at this sort of because many of you are planning to be teachers, and you should know, know a little about your teacher history. Uh, this is an excellent new book, uh, New Moral Order, Gender, Religion, and the Changing Purposes of American Higher Education, 1837 to 1917. Basically a, a type of precursor. Uh, she spends a lot of time, this is the author, Andrea Turpin, she's at Baylor, young professor there, but, you know, doing great stuff, and, uh, and she writes about women's uh, vision of education, and this is, you know, this is this great role of woman. This is the woman downtown at the mission to the Chinese in San Diego, you know, these are the kinds of women, is, is teachers. So we can talk about these people who have become great architects and other things like that, lawyers, suffragettes, things like that. But the women who become teachers become hugely influential in this story. This thing I showed you before is the Los Angeles uh, high school faculty. And uh, what uh, Turpin's book does is go back to the teacher education and how, how professional education moves from being dominated by male but being dominated by women. 
And the great promoter of women's role as professional teachers, uh, there's uh, two of them really, and this is the this is the Beecher. This is Catherine Beecher here. Catherine's this one here. No, no, that's Catherine there. Beecher family's hugely influential in American history in general. But then Catherine Beecher dedicates her life. She never gets married. Dedicates her life to education. Runs the school. Runs different things. And writes lots of textbooks. And like you have this American women's home. Okay. It's this sort of development of home economics, you know. And uh, home economics, domestic economy. What we have, I think, family and consumer sciences is what it's called here on campus. Home economics is actually a little redundant because eco means home. So that's a good, I, I like the term home economics, but uh, it is redundant. So family consumer sciences, sure, why not? But it's this basic idea, organizing, you see, ordering and making healthy. And women become very involved in education in general, but especially education toward health. And so then we'll talk about that. And also spirituality. Catherine Beecher's father was a, uh, a revivalist, and he helped start Oberlin College back east, anti-slavery you know, college and stuff like this, but deeply religious. Uh, but Catherine Beecher, <coughs> as, as Turpin's book brings out, she had, had sort of a higher level of, of teaching leaders, you know, stuff like that. A much more sort of like evangelical, sort of heartfelt, you know, Christian education uh, 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 vision was created by this woman, Mary Lyon. And, and she uh, creates what is now Wheaton College, the one in Massachusetts, and then also Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. And uh, she values... Uh, you know, just this really broad base, bring, bring women, let's educate all women, let's, and it's really, let's educate them, especially in a way that their, their spiritual life, the Christianity actually uh, supports progressivism. And this is a very important aspect of progressivism, is this sort of spiritual Christian progressivism. We're going to talk more about that uh, next time. But uh, in California... What, one of our first colleges is actually Mills Seminary, uh, 1852. And it was founded first by Mary Atkins, who's a graduate of Oberlin College and has that influence of Oberlin. But then it's taken over by Susan Mills and her husband. And uh, she's a graduate of Mary Lyons College. So she brings a lot of Mary Lyons' vision of Christian progressivism to Mills College, and then um, Mills College moves from Benicia down to Oakland, and is today, in Northern California at least, uh, the preeminent women's college. Southern preeminent women's college would be Scripps College, so we're going to talk about Scripps too. Hey, before we get there, let's talk about us here at Point Loma. You know, we're about right here. This is Catherine Tangley. And one of the things about this Theosophical Society here, it's a utopian community in some ways. It's a really interesting place, but fundamentally it's a college. It's all, she uh, creates it as a, she charters it as a university in 1909. And uh, it's a whole system. You have uh, dormitories here for, for young children and at an academy called the Raja Yoga Academy. And it goes on through being a Theosophical University. Here's the kids of the academy. This, uh, these buildings are, are over where the library is now. These are gone. But this Raja Yoga Academy, uh, women who create schools, women have a vision for, for a type of religious, spiritual wholeness that is, we're involved with physical health, promoting physical health. We're also promoting educational you know, knowledge and growth of knowledge. And we're also cre uh, uh, promoting spiritual health. And California has a lot of this going on. And here we get to then the Hearst Gymnasium for women at uh, UC Berkeley. Okay. And uh, UC Berkeley has a lot of feminine aspects to it, which uh, play into what we're talking about today. And You know, it'd be fun to work on that all out someday. I don't know. Maybe someone's written a book. I don't know. But 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about Phoebe Hurst and Jane Stanford in their relationship to education. Phoebe, both have the benefit of marrying very wealthy men. Uh, both have the benefit of those men are older and they die. And so these two women get a lot of freedom at the end of their life with a tremendous amount of wealth. And, uh, and so they become sort of a, in a competitive mode, the creators of our two, you know, flagship universities, Stanford and, and Berkeley, okay? Now, uh, let's talk about uh, their husbands just for a second, just so you can look at these good-looking guys. Uh, neither of them very honorable, neither of them really very interesting. You know, yeah, they got rich, they got powerful, both became senators, both, uh, he became a governor also. Not very interesting, really, in the big picture of life. So, let's move on, though, but there, they did get pressed. Uh, Stanford, this Stanford University, the kid dies. It's actually called Leland Stanford Junior University because it's named after their son that died. And uh, it, was a, it was a passion of Jane that it get built. And then Jane built this, uh, this, is, this is Stanford. It's one that got to be one of the most beautiful universities in all of the world. Uh, and, uh, and this is the, uh, the uh, chapel that Jane had dedicated, and, or built and dedicated for her husband when he died. And so this is the chapel at Stanford University, and chap Stanford has a chapel. That's a big deal. Uh, they were religious. They're not committed to any denomination. Uh, adopting such a philosophy they have felt would permit church to serve the broadest spiritual needs of the university community. Uh, Stanford's also saw spiritual and moral values as essential to a young person's education and the future citizenship. One of the fun things about Stanford is that it was free. Uh, uh, Jane said she's adopting the children of, of, of California. Male and female, it was free to go. And one of the people, first people to graduate from Stanford was Herbert Hoover, who became president. Now, Phoebe, I had to read about. She's fascinating. She is fascinating. This is her house that she had built out in Pleasanton in the East Bay, a little warmer than San Francisco, although she had her big San Francisco mansion, too. Her husband dies, and she really does dedicate herself to being what is she believes is, a, is an important progressive woman. She had been a school teacher as a... As a um, uh, child, you read about that, uh, filled with sort of evangelical spirit, too. Uh, you know, Christian evangelicalism and education. That's what she wanted to support. And then, uh, in her way, she didn't found Berkeley, but she uh, poured money, money, money into making Berkeley one of the greatest universities in the world. And Sather Tower and these central buildings that run along here, uh, and then the Hearst building, I'll show you. These are all paid for by her. Berkeley needed it. This is the Hearst Mining Building at Berkeley. You know, really, in some ways, one of the most beautiful buildings there. And then this is the Hearst Gymnasium for Women. She put a lot of her values into it. We're going to meet later on a woman down here at Scripps Institute, uh, Mary Ritter. And Ritter is the first woman on faculty at Berkeley, who is the uh, paid for by, by Hearst, and she is there to take care of women's health issues, sort of a kinesiology professor uh, at, at the, for the women there, uh, dean of women, faculty of kinesiology type of thing, and women's health issues. And there, this is, this is the Hearst vision, okay? So it's physical health, spiritual health, it's the whole package. It's a lot what we do here at Point Loma, Nazarene University, and still. And these progressive women have, have really inspired the California to, to have these great institutions that do this. Now, uh, one of the uh, Phoebe's other interests, which I gave you also to read about, is, is uh, architecture and Julia Morgan, supporting this architect. She's building a lot of things. She's paying for a lot of things, and if you're paying for a lot of things, building a lot of things, you get to pick the architect. And so, so she supports women's architecture, and she supports this woman uh, who had graduated from Berkeley, went off to Paris, comes back, 
And then, uh, and we get a lot of YWCA's, Young Women's Christians Association. And these YWCA's, often designed by Julia Morgan, are places where, again, progressive women often come use them as educational centers for immigrant women, uh, teaching health issues, pregnancy issues, all sorts of, of uh, community benefits like that, plus promoting um, you know, physical health and things like that, spiritual health. So this is a church uh, in Berkeley, I think on College Avenue. It's a beautiful church there in Berkeley. Uh, and then this is another Julia Morgan building. This is a Selimar. A Selimar was founded in Pacific Grove out here. This is Monterey Bay, Pacific Grove, where uh, this is for summer, for women to gather, you know, college women. You know, college women are, you know, it, it just, and college educated women and all the great women of California have a connection. So almost every woman, uh, you know, that's got wealth in California is putting money into the YWCA's and to a CLMR, and it becomes a great center of, of women's dynamism, sort of a, uh, a club, on, a, a local club on steroids, you know, for, uh, for women. Uh, this is just uh, what happens to uh, when, when Phoebe dies, you know, the husband dies, yeah, that's, that's great, uh, the money gets poured into good things, and then when the mom dies, William Randolph Hearst pours money into what is a, just a stupid debacle in California. But we uh, turn to Scripps, okay, Ellen Scripps. And then um, she's, uh, she's interesting because she didn't get her, she made her money. She never married. She, she uh, worked with her brothers in the Scripps, you know, newspaper stuff. She wrote, she managed, she's a smart woman, she's a big sister. And she had invested, and so she comes out of, out of the Scripps. Uh, she's 60 years old when she moves to California. Lives to be 90, so 30 years, last 30 years. But, but uh, 60 years old, she arrives here very wealthy. And she brings her little brother, who's also very socially uh, responsible and stuff like this. And uh, she's very interested in sort of spirituality things, but more along the lines of theosophy and, and these sort of more spiritualist ideas, you know, seances, levitations, things like that. But she is going to fund, at the end of her life, pour her money into creating Scripps College, which is the great women's college of Southern California. You know, beautiful place here. And a uh, new book, uh, Molly... Uh, McLean is out here at USC, uh, USD, <laughs> um, and she's our local uh, local historian, and she has done a great biography here of Ellen Scripps. And, and you know, Ellen Scripps may be, Molly was telling us at a dinner thing, may be the richest woman in all of the United States. I mean, this woman, she, uh, her older brother George dies, and so she gets a pile of money from him. And she decides to start pouring it into things. And this is her brother's estate where Scripps, you know, when you live out in Scripps Ranch, this is the Scripps Ranch the, that uh, Edward Scripps lived at. So you get the women's club at La Jolla. <coughs> she uses La Jolla as a sort of center of all of her, um, you know, philanthropies and things like that, with especially uh, gathering women together for, uh, for this and creates a school, a bishop, it's called Bishop's School, it's, it's there, it was initially for girls, but it became for boys too, <laughs> then uh, promotes, uh, and she and Edward uh, promote Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and, uh, and then this is the Mary Bennett Ritter I told you about, who's actually born in Salinas, moves to Gilroy, becomes a doctor uh, in California, then heads off to Berkeley to be this professor, and there, of course, she marries another professor, and the two of them then go to create uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography over here. And she's a fascinating woman. Here again, these couples, these uh, highly dynamic intellectual couples. There's a picture of her when she's younger. And so what we have is a, a women's sort of culture of progressivism and just run through, just throwing things out. Hopefully some of this will just interest you. Go on Google, chase this down, give me a call, work it out. 
Uh, just as a close, let's end with what I think is one of the most fun things in California, just because I drive up Highway 101 all the time, is when you're in the Tascadero, which is north of San Luis Obispo, you'll see this building. You can see it from the freeway, okay? And it was, Edward Gardner Lewis ran a women's magazine. And women's magazines in the 19th century were massively influential around all over America. This is where progressive women really put their heart and soul into domestic gardening, architecture design, all sorts of stuff. And it's really, really sort of interesting. And so, so up north, here's Los Angeles. You go up one one. Up above San Luis Obispo is Atascadero right there. And Atascadero uh, was, was uh, um, going to be this women's colony. It's not just for women, but it's it was to start out to give a bunch of women who had been abused or divorced or for whatever reason, women needed a little uh, boost to get them going. And it was going to be a sort of communal uh, Jeffersonian. Everybody has their little garden plot. They gather together for, for uh, market days and stuff like that. And then they have this, this beautiful building here. Great nature, refuge of the weary heart, and only balm of breasts that have been bruised. And this... This is symmetrical all around. So every, every facade has a, a little statement like this. The lasting happiness. We turn our eyes to one alone that she surrounds you now. Mother nature, you know. On the south side, let us keep our faces to the sunshine and we will not see the shadows. A little uplift there. And then that uh, sort of a standard line among so many who come to California. So many trying to get a new start. So many want to create a new economy in the world the most valuable of all arts will be that of deriving a comfortable subsistence from the smallest area of soil and this was what these women were supposed to do so I leave you there <coughs> if you want to talk about any of these women it's always fun so uh, call me up we can do that